thank you so much again for this opportunity to share my story um, and share our story. And thank you to everyone for taking the time out of your Easter weekend to attend. I really appreciate it. Um, but before I get into the technicalities of the topic, I'd like to briefly share my journey to INS, um, as this was a field that I never ever considered. And there were many what I actually thought to be wrong turns and decisions, which actually turned out to be blessings in disguise. And maybe someone out there can relate or they can take something from this. So my journey started, started I was born and bred in Cape Town, South Africa. And after the trick, I started a teaching degree and realized that wasn't really for me. Um, I worked in retail and then I went on to complete my um, Bachelor of Science degree in Biodiversity and Conservation Biology. And after graduating in 2010, I lacked work experience within my field of studies to be able to apply for work. Um, and I recognized that I needed to find opportunities to build my experience. And I then reached out to various people and places to volunteer. And I eventually met um, the reserve manager within the city of Cape Town Nature Conservation Department who was prepared to give me an opportunity. And I basically worked on a full-time basis in a voluntary position, fulfilling a role as an assistant reserve manager. And through this, I gained invaluable experience in many facets of nature reserve management. Um, but I still continue to work in retail um, throughout my studies, throughout this volunteering opportunity. I applied for jobs throughout. I tried anyway and everywhere um, within the conservation field. And I eventually got an internship position with the South African National Biodiversity Institute. Um, and I was a DNA barcoding intern based at the Center of Excellence for Invasion Biology, which is at Stellenbosch University. And here I met two passionate entomologists um, working with ants and working with springtails. And that is where I fell in love with insects. That is where I was exposed to insects. And Excuse the pun, but this is where the bug but me, the insect bug, at least. Um, and from that, I then got involved with the Imbovani Outreach Project, which is also based at Telebosch within the CIP, and I was an assistant technical officer there. And that project focuses predominantly on outreach, but also and as a large end research component. And through this journey, I met people who were prepared to give me a chance, and I gained invaluable experiences. I learned so much. And I received wonderful recommendations from all of these um, opportunities. And that then brought me to my current position, which is now where I'm based. I live and work in Eisner in the Garden Route um, with South Africa National Parks. And I'm a terrestrial fauna biotechnician within the scientific services department. So my role broadly involves working with the scientists, um, specifically on terrestrial fauna research and monitoring. So I assist them with implementing um, the research and monitoring to broadly tell you a bit about that. But um, my first take home message would be that you should embrace the pace and also the direction of your journey. Um, realize that nobody's journey is the same. Trust your journey. Also be proud of your journey because even when you don't understand that um, opportunities are not always gonna come to you. So you need to go out and look for those opportunities and don't be afraid to make sacrifices, you will have to make sacrifices along the way. Um, you, it's going to all be worth it in the end. Um, so now to introduce my topic, to introduce insects, I thought to introduce insects as if you were one of the school groups that I was presenting to. And of course, it, it would be better in person as the learners often feed off the energy in the moment. Um, and virtually you don't kind of get that same experience, but um, this is just to kind of give you a taste of what our lessons entail and also share what I know about insects. Um, so just to also mention that outreach and environmental education is not one of our core functions within scientific services, but we assist and collaborate with other departments within the organization and also other um, conservation authorities within our region. Um, and we also create opportunities and find opportunities and schools approach us to do lessons and things like that. Um, so I often ask to tell the learners that I'm very excited to find out about what they know, what do they know about insects, um, and then also share what I know about insects, because they are basically the little things that run the world. 
And often when people think of insects, they probably are quick to grab a can of insecticide or their shoe or something to kill it. Um, and sometimes it comes because of a genuine fear of insects. It can be because of a fear of germs. Um, or sometimes insects are considered to be an inconvenience. And just a fun fact, um, out of over a million known different insect species, only one to three percent of those are considered pests and those are all related to transformed landscapes so landscapes that are associated with humans so that's just the thought to to keep in mind but is it also because mainstream media is telling us that insects are bad i mean this is just a couple of examples of what we find on tv every day what's out on social media messages like um love free without insects or, or no insect is safe um kill instantly, keep the environment clean. And these adverts don't paint a positive picture about insects, but there is so much more to know when it comes to insects. Not, not just about how fascinating they are, but how crucial they are for our existence and our survival. So I thought let's get a bit elementary and start with the basics by asking a question, what are insects and how can they be distinguished from, from other animals? So Every known living thing on earth is classified and named by a set of rules. So the same set of rules is used all over the world. And just like we've all got our names and our surnames and our family names, all organisms, all living things on earth have their name and surname. And these names are called scientific names. And living things are named by a process called taxonomy. So taxonomy basically is just a way of grouping different living things, um, based on the differences, but also the similarities. So basically what each organism has in common. So when you're wanting to identify or classify animals, the two big groups would be, um, one would be vertebrates. So that's where mammals and where we would fall under because we've got spines, we've got backbones, we've got vertebrae. So we are classified under vertebrates, but the species that lack backbones um, that don't have spines are known as invertebrates. And this is where insects fall under because they don't have a backbone. So within taxonomy, there are more characteristics that are then used to split insects away from all other animals. And I'll just touch on that just so that you can, you don't have to pay attention to the um, terminology, but just so that you know where insects fit into the bigger picture. So insects belong to this big group called arthropods. Um, and sometimes if I try to want to understand the word, I often break it up. But arthropods is basically, it's a Latin word. I mean, broken up, arthron means jointed and podis means legs. So all organisms within or invertebrates within this group um, have jointed legs. And this group also includes other invertebrates like millipedes and centipedes. Um, and Marit, close your eyes, also includes spiders and scorpions. So you'll note that all of these have jointed legs. So arthropods are then further broken down into different groups. And the next group that insects belong to is hexapoda. And that word broken up is in Latin means hexa is six and podus means legs. So everything within, or all the invertebrates within this group um, have six jointed legs. So these are just two examples of two different invertebrates or two different insects. They look different, but they both have that main characteristic of six jointed legs. And then the last group that insects belong to um, is insecta. And that's starting to sound a little bit more familiar, but um, within this group, there are three defining characteristics that split insects away from all of the other invertebrates and all the other arthropods that also form or in this group. So all insects have, as we've already established, they've got six jointed legs. They've got bodies that are divided into three distinct sections. So head, thorax, and abdomen, and all insects have antennae. So those are the three main distinguishing characters of insects. And I found this, um, cute meme on social media that the kids may be familiar with the Marvel character Thor. So it says that all insects have three main body regions, head, the abdomen, and Thor's axe or the thorax. So I thought that's a cute way for them to remember. 
So here are a couple of examples of insects. And as you can see, they all look very different from each other, but they all have those three defining characteristics. They all have six legs, all have the three base sections, the head, the abdomen, and the thorax, and they all have antennae. Looks very different from each other, but those core characteristics are it. So we've answered the question of, about what are insects, what they are, and how they can be identified. So the next question is then, so what? Um, why are they important in nature? Um, basically, what are their ecosystem roles? So pollination is one of the well-known um, benefits of insects. And it's, they, insects play an important role to help flowers make seeds. So pollination is very important and important process for plant reproduction. And this also helps um, turn flowers into fruit and veg, if you put it basically. Um, insects also help disperse um, and bury seeds, which also protects them from predation and fire. And this is particularly important in Feinbos, which is one of our endemic ecosystems in South Africa. Um, and it's a fire-driven system. So when a fire comes along and it burns everything on the ground, when the first rain comes, all these seeds that were planted by the insects then are able to regenerate. Um, and what we also tell the kids is that all the natural vegetation around us, it wasn't planted there by people. It, different animals were involved in planting those seeds for us to create the beautiful landscapes that we've got um, within our environment. Insects are also food for other animals and they also control their own population sometimes. Um, so they are predator and prey um, species. And just like vultures and hyenas do, um, they are our cleaners. Um, they help decompose dead organic matter. And one thing that we must also note is that all of these ecosystem roles, they fulfill, insects fulfill these roles for free. We don't have to pay them to do it. Our job is just to protect them, basically. So then my second take-home message would be that insects matter. Um, we can't survive without them. We, don't, we wouldn't have our beautiful biodiversity. We wouldn't have healthy ecosystems. And Edward Wilson, who's, who's a well-known biologist, um, is also was a big entomologist and he did a lot of work with ants. Um, he said that so important are insects and other land-dwelling arthropods that if all were to disappear, humanity probably would not last more than a few months. And that for me is quite striking because insects are often underestimated. So throughout, throughout the talks that we give to the kids, um, try to make it as interactive as possible. Um, because bless them, kids, they, they, the learners, their attention span is not always um, that long. So we try to make it as interactive as possible. Um, so we give them the opportunity throughout to ask questions. We also in turn quiz them um, to find out who's actually been paying attention. Um, we give them short quizzes about, they must identify of A, B, and C, which one is the insect, and why is it the insect? We also use a mix of imagery and videos um, to keep their attention. And it's also, it's, it's quite interactive and they don't have to listen to one voice the whole time. Um, and we also do some exercises, um, leg stretch and brain gym exercises just to keep the attention span. But we also do a couple of practicals which I will touch on in just a little bit. And then we get to my favorite insect, which is ants. Um, and the study of ants is known as mammacology. Um, I must mention that I don't consider myself a mammacologist, um, but I am experienced in identifying the different type of ants in South Africa. And part of my work, um, I'm slowly but surely building a database of ant species within the Gondrut National Park. And this is also where I get the learners to assist in collecting that um, data. And this is where I must also give credit to Imvani because what I've learned with him, um, I still carry with me today and I've adapted the things that I've learned there and I share them now and I continue with it on my side now. So during our lessons, we, we try to take learners through a simplified scientific method. Um, so we start off with the theory um, and we, we it's basically our way of gathering information on what what, what do we want to do, um, what do we want to investigate, together work out what our research questions are. And that's how you would basically start your projects or your, your research. So we start um, with that. 
for them. And then we go over to the data collection side. So this would be the practical. Um, we will teach them about the different sampling techniques that are used to collect ants um, and other insects. And then they then need to go and implement it and go and collect the insects themselves. Um, I must also just share a couple more pictures because the kids have no problem getting on the ground um, just to look for ants. We don't have to beg them. And the excitement and curiosity is most of the time it's genuine. And that, that for me, it means a lot. Um, we open their eyes to another world that they may not have been exposed to. Um, so this is my favorite part of um, working with, with learners. Um, and as I mentioned, we um, we try to structure the lessons in a way that uh, in some way contributes to our collections um, and also to our monitoring project. So a two-way learning exercise. They learn about insects, about biodiversity, and we get assistance in our data collection. And then the last bit would be, um, or for them at least, within the scientific method would be the data analysis. So in other words, the sample processing, the species identifications and so on. Um, so yeah, we then show them how to identify ant, and that's what I will share with you now. So first of all, what makes an ant an ant? So as we've already distinguished with in the taxonomic process, because ants are insects, they have six jointed legs. Um, and ants have what they call an elbow antennae, and I'll often um, use my arm to demonstrate. Um, let me just get my the laser pointer. So ants have this um, stuff part of the antennae known as the scape, and this is a distinct character um, that ants have, particularly the ant workers. Um, you do get other um, specific, especially the hymenopterans, the wasps and the um, bees, they also have a small little bend, but ants have this quite long um, antennae segment that's known as the scape. And then attached to that will be the several um, antennae segments. And this is, this is um, a distinguishing character in ants at least. And then, um, Ants also have a narrow waist. Um, and again, I'm an opterans do have this, but ants have the specific um, connection here that's known that connects the, the thorax with the abdomen, and that's known as the petiole. And all ants have this, and only and the hymenopterans don't have this little connection. Um, and it, this varies between the different ant species. Some have two and some have one. I'll share a couple of images now, but this is very distinct in, in ants. So just to share a couple of features that we look at when we identify ants, um, as I've mentioned, that little connection, um, the petiole, it differs in size and shape and number between species. Some species have one, like those on the left-hand side, and some have two, and the shapes vary. Um, some ants have spines, um, and the length and the number of spines differs between species. And here we will often ask the learners, what do they think the spines are used for? Um, if they think of trees and, and plants with thorns, that would have be a, um, um, a defense mechanism. Though I don't know this little ant in the bottom left with their tiny spines, how, how much that protects them. But um, some ants have spines and some don't have spines. Um, we also look at the, the shape of the, what we call the alley trunk, or that would be the, the thorax. Um, and the spines usually sit over here. So the shape of that part of the, of the thorax, we also look at. Um, and also we have a look at their eyes that varies between species. So some have eyes and some don't have eyes. Um, so the, the one on the top left, um, that one is doesn't have any eyes. So we would ask the learners, okay, where, where do you think those ants live? If you think of moles that are blind, um, they live under, predominantly underground and, and it's the same with this ant species. Then you get the ant species that have very big eyes and this is the forest. Um, and species. So we can use that to also give us an indication of where they live and what they feed on. Same with the mandibles. Um, the shape and size is very between species. So um, species like this with, uh, with a big mouth, um, 
mouth parts, they would be predatory ants um, feeding on other ants or other insect species. And then you get these with the tiny mouth parts, um, probably nectar feeders or seed feeders. Um, so we also look at those. So we share a lot of that information with the learners and then we've put together basic keys based on the common ants that we find in the areas that we claim to sample in. And they then identify their own ants. And they're often so excited to look at the ants through the little mini microscopes that we have. Um, they're excited to see the different parts and the spines. And they're always calling us to show us the different um, ants that they've managed to collect. Um, so this is always a nice part of the practical. And then rounding off now, just to share one of the other tools that we use that involves insects um, within our outreach lessons, which is the mini SAS tool. And this was a tool that was developed by Ground Truth. And it is a, it's a simple and accessible citizen science tool that's used nationally for monitoring the water quality and also to assess the health of river systems. Um, and mini SAS basically stands for mini stream assessment scoring system. Um, so we'll take the learners out to a couple of other systems just to expose them to other habitats and other forms of insect monitoring. Um, so we usually show them how we do the collecting. Um, we show them how we collect the samples in the different biotopes that we have. And then we get the learners to do the assessment, the rubber assessment themselves. So um, the Ground Truth team have created very nice keys, identification keys, that they, the learners then use themselves to identify their insect groups. Um, and also you, the, the website has many resources that are freely available to use and it's very easy to implement. And it's a very good um, tool to contribute to. So the learners then identify the um, insect groups based on the identification keys and the assessment involves um, identifying the different families within of the insects that are found in the water. And generally, this is the larval stages of the terrestrial um, adults. So each insect is given a sensitivity score. The lower the score, the less sensitive your species is, and the higher your score, the more sensitivities. So impacted systems, um, systems that maybe have a lot of pollution or disturbance, um, they would have more low scoring species. So then you would know that that system is not in a very good state. And healthy or pristine or near pristine ecosystems will have more of the higher scoring species. So they then calculate all these scores and those scores then get assigned to an ecological category. And then they're able to tell us what the ecological category or the condition is of the river system that they've worked in. So to end off, and my last take home message would be that passion engages and passion is contagious. And I'm a strong believer of that because if it wasn't for meeting passionate people along my journey, I wouldn't know what I know today. I wouldn't be where I am and I wouldn't have found my passions. And for that, I'm forever grateful. So I'm always excited to share what I know and to share my passion with the learners and in the hope that they pick up this bug that has bitten me a good couple of years ago. So thank you again for the opportunity and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Melanie, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you, Han, to handle the questions and answers simply because I can't see everybody's screen. However, before we go to questions and answers, um, strangely and um, by coincidence, so... I just, listening to you, I wrote down passion cells, not knowing what your last slide is going to be, because uh, I, I, I was so impressed with your passion and your knowledge, and that cells. It really, really makes such a big difference if you have this passion for what you are doing and how you really zone into the facts and the details and also the beauty of what you shared with us tonight. Um, I can just imagine how big an impact it's got on younger learners and people who listen to you. And um, I do want to just encourage you in one way, and that is to say that in 2014 at the World Parks Congress, the decision was taken by the Africa leaders 
that we should spend about 50% of our conservation budgets in education and investing in the curricula of schools, because without that, we're not going to get anywhere. And you have put your time and investment in absolutely the right um, audience and want to congratulate you for what you are doing. Also, the encouragement of your unique development. I think there are younger people here on tonight and they wonder where they would go with their own careers and just having that uh, sort of uh, to embrace the pace of your development is really beautiful. And lastly, I just want to say, um, uh, shocked is the wrong word, but I'm surprised to see what is written on these different in, in, insecticides. I, I mean, I just didn't, mm -hmm. I haven't looked at it. And it's just incredible to see that. And also to say, well, there's something that we have to talk about and raise our voice about. But well done. Thank you so much. So this is the part of the evening where you are welcome to participate and ask questions. Um, so you are welcome to use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen. Or you can um, raise your hand, wave at us, or you can write a question in the chat. Um, I see Carol Preston's got a question there. Um, she says, I might have missed this, but what are the ages of the learners that you target? Thanks. Thanks so much for the question. The ages vary um, from crash kids, from five years old. And that was, I must admit, it was a challenge because you really have to simplify um, your talk coming from a scientific background. But I must believe, I must say that they had the the most fun of all the learners that we've met. They were so intrigued by all of the ants. But starting um, from crash kids up until high school, um, we've even gave lessons, given lessons to university students um, that are still building the experience. So it really varies. And you had a 60-year-old learner here tonight that also learned. Ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> 60, 60 plus. <laughs> 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 some some older kids tonight also want to mention that we already have a talk of melanie on the share screen africa platform and that one is on um endangered species in bees if i can remember correctly and it's actually not what you expect it to be so head over and go and see that one as well there's a question from chepo in the chat um <clears throat> let me just quickly scroll up again do you advise when we see ants in the house, we let them live since they are important for various purposes? Yes, thanks for the question. That's what I often get. Um, and I must say, I also have a lot of problems with ants. And um, yeah, I, I am against the use of insecticides, but I try to solve the other, the some, you, um, Killing the, the insect is just, you're not so, um, solving the problem. You just, you're not really addressing the symptoms. Um, so what's what's causing them to come into the house? Um, what's attracting them? Um, try to deal with those sorts of things first. Is the habitat, it's the same would go for cockroach and rodents. Um, what's attracting them? Is the habitat available? Are your areas clean? Um, I sometimes, if I can embarrassingly admit, the ants help me identify where I missed the spot. <laughs> um, I sometimes let them live freely because um, I always live with um, open windows. So I've got spiders and stuff coming in. And then the spiders have something to eat. I've got geckos coming in and they also have something to eat. So I do sweep away the ants. I avoid using insecticides. It's just off about managing the situation as best as you can. I know it is a frustration. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's of any help at all. <laughs> that's that's actually a, a good point that you make. It's and it's another perspective on it to 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 think about the fact that the ants are actually showing you where you missed a spot in cleaning in your house. So they're actually your your um your pointers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Andy Klee is writing in the chat. I'm sure we had a talk that said it was a tradition in some communities to start making beer when ants come into your house as it means visitors are coming. 
<laughs> that sounds like a plan. <laughs> good, good indication. Uh, Melanie, just on the other level, my assumption is that when you use insecticides, that there's a ripple effect of obviously other insects that would be eating those dead ones. Is Have you looked at that in terms of what is that ripple effect? Yeah, um, because a lot of these insecticides, although they say they are they target specific species, they more often than not don't. Um, and that's also when I started loving on my own and getting frustrated with all the ants coming in, I started using the ant traps and I found a dead chameleon in my garden. And that that was eye opening for me. And ever since then I avoided using um any sort of insecticide. Um, and I'm glad that that happened. I'm not glad for the chameleon, but that really it opened my eyes to the knock-on effect of, of all these poisons that we put out to kill insects. Um, and it has an impact on us as well. Um, um, our animals that come into the house, the children that use the house, um, the, the pollinators or insects that we actually want to attract in our gardens, that has a ripple effect on them. Um, so all of these actions have very negative consequences that we also need to keep in mind. Thank you. Andy, you're welcome to unmute. Good to see you. Oh, hi. Yeah, good to see you guys too. Thanks, Melanie. Um, I do a bit of work with schools and stuff here, and I really like the idea of insects because it's sort of wildlife. You can see wherever you are um, pretty much every day. How do you get your students to take this home with them? Um, um, one thing we do here is encourage people to make bug hotels, sort of little scraps of sticks and piles of stones and maybe little sort of, you know, scruffy areas in the corner of the schoolyard or the garden to so that they can see insects and encourage them and, and value them. Do you do any sort of projects to get the guys to take things home? And how does that stick? Um, what we've actually been wanting to do over the last of years is have some sort of mentorship program so it's not just about having these once off events um, where we just do a lesson and then forget about them those kids that are actually genuinely interested in insects we have invited them back um, to join us in our offices join us in our lab space um, to come and learn a bit more um, we have had a couple of groups that have had various interactions that we've had various interactions with us over different programs um, I know of one um, local um, girl that went into study conservation because of our interactions. So we try through that. Um, we have also worked with one of the schools and they built their own bug hotels for the school grounds. So that was also something, but we were working on that because we want to make this a more of a long-term thing to get people a lot more involved or especially the learners a lot more involved and bring them into to entomology and insect conservation but that's still plan that we're trying to implement get people on board and yeah no, that's cool great work thank you thanks Andy. Thanks. any other questions i'm not seeing any hands raised uh let's just check the first there's a question in the chat from kirsten yeah. Yes. Um, is there a shortage of myrmecologists? That, that, Thanks for the question. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think entomologists in general, um, there is a shortage, but I must um, say that ant, ant knowledge or ant picking up on, on myrmecology is, or it's picking up quite a bit, especially on eye naturalists. You're seeing a lot more citizen science and specialists. Um, so that's also a very nice platform that exposing people to to ants. Um, so I think there are a couple of people, um, but yeah, I think entomology in general, it's, a, it's, it's not a very popular field, especially in South Africa, but at least we've got Caswell. I see Caswell is also on the group and um, or in the today's talk and he's one of the top Mamacologists in the country. So, and he was also part of my journey. <laughs> yeah, and Cashwell very assertively says, yes, there's a sort of shortage. Don't doubt it. There's a shortage. <laughs> very clear. Thanks, Cashwell. Thank you very much. I don't know if you want to come in, Cashwell, um, uh, if you want to add anything or uh, just join the discussion. 
Yeah, I completely agree with Melanie. I, I mean, I met her as she just joined as well. It's quite nice to see her in this through this journey again. Um, yeah, this shortage overall, uh, actually, all the people who are working on insects or entomologists, they're quite old, uh, and you know, the knowledge is not being passed down. So, don't have young entomologists you know using taxonomists, particularly for insects. And that's a very big problem that we have. Um, if we look at the, the spiders, for example, as another group of other folk, we've got uh, Professor Ansi Dipinar in ARC. Um, and I don't see another any other young uh, person coming in, you know. Uh, and it's it's quite a very um, yeah worrying thing. I'm, I'm at the university, and I think it's my job as well to train more entomologists and more molecologists. And they're coming in. And also the space where they're supposed to work, it's it's not, I don't see much okay. of it either. Like, you know, it's museums and stuff like that, but there's no much of them. But we've got people like Milani, who's just incredible. You know, if we can get at least a year, 10 Milanis, I think we'll be safe. Thank you. Thank you. And let's take that message forward. No there's Valente. a question from Sela, Chris, um, okay. in the chat. Yes. Um, Sela is also saying, thank you, Melanie. I have also done some lessons on insects, but I have had problems in making an insect box to be used as a teaching resource. How do you preserve them? So for long-term storage, thank, thanks, Sela, for the question. Um, for long-term storage, we usually store them in ethanol, um, at least 95% ethanol. Um, but then we would mount um, a representative, at least a couple of representatives of each spe species that we collect. And that's what we put into our insect boxes. Um, there's a very specific way to mount it and you need a, um, a good and patient hand to mount. That's also very good for long-term storage. And you would need to store it in a clean, dry area where it can't get moldy or get access to moths and things like that. Um, I hope that answers your question, Sela. Question from No No Valentino. Uh, sorry, now I jumped, but I think the question was uh, about climate change. What's the impact that climate change has got on the behavior of uh, the ants, and how do they adapt? Um, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, that's actually quite a tricky one. It that definitely does have a large impact on insects. And some insects tend to do a lot better um, with the, the climates that are changing. Um, and one species, for example, that's indigenous to South Africa, um, Castle, you will know Fidoli. Um, Fidoli megacephalus cephalus specifically, they are indigenous to South Africa, but one of the top 100 worst invasive species globally. And what I've noticed in the garden is their population has exploded and it's it's becoming quite a bit of, it's becoming a problem. And they are also problematic. I'm involved with the post-fire monitoring in the Brenton Blue Butterfly Reserve. I, some of you may know about the critically endangered, critically endangered Brenton Blue Butterfly. I mean, following the big Neisner fires in 2017, um, we haven't found the butterfly again. And this butterfly has a specific relationship with an ant, a, um, a sh large sugar ant called Campanitis. Um, and this ant has also not been found in the reserve. The ant itself is not threatened. It's quite widespread, but it hasn't been found in the reserve because of this, this ant that has overtaken um, the area because of the disturbance that, have, that has come in. But also the temperatures have risen quite a lot. We're not getting as much rain as before, and they are thriving. Um, and I think the same would happen for a lot of other insect species. Some would do well and some will cope and others won't because they can't deal with this drastic temperature changes or drastic droughts or weather impacts and stuff like that. So I haven't been focusing too much on climate change impacts, but it definitely does have a large um, impact on insects. <laughs> Thank you. There's, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, this was the similar question that Sophia Luca, Sophia Luca asked, uh, we, could, we, we couldn't hear. So you've responded to his question too, which is in the chat now. 
And also, Sala Malanga came back and she thanked you for your response to her question. Thanks. I just want to check if there are any other questions in the chat, Joan, that we've missed. I saw a question by um, J.B. Ixtian um, about how many species have, do we currently know about in the garden route? I'm not too sure if it's a little bit earlier up in the chat. I'm All happy right, to answer okay. that. Yeah, please go. While you got it, go for it, please, man. Okay. Um. So so far, I've um I've been looking at the literature that's been con um or the studies that have been done in the area, um collecting ants myself, um working with all the reference collections. So we found uh, roughly about eighty different species. Um, but many will know that the Garden Route National Park or the Garden Route itself um, manages the largest forest complex or has the largest forest complex within South Africa. And I'm finding a couple of interesting species specifically within the forest um, that the last specimen, if I'm correct, was collected in the 1970s. So that I'm hoping to find again so that you can get that species described because it hasn't been described yet. Um, but so far we have about 80, 80 to 90 different species. And I'm, there's probably a lot more. We just need to still find them. But I'm wanting to focus a lot on the forest um, because the forest is quite an undiscovered <laughs> um, habitat. Um, and it's one of the smallest habitats in South Africa. And the second part of the question was, have I identified species in other places outside of the Western Cape? And I have been involved in some projects that I've done work in the Northern Cape and in KZN, but a lot of work that I've been involved in has focused on the Western Cape, but Northern Cape was another area that I've been to and sampled in. So thanks, thanks for that question. Thank you. And then Melanie, a lovely comment by Evan Alberts. It's amazing how we as 80 year olds are learning things that such young learners know. So thank you. You're never owe too old to learn. And uh, it is amazing and it is beautiful. It's, it's, it's the beauty of, of the surprise of, uh, of, the, of nature. Thank you very much. Chris, I don't see any further questions at the moment. Yeah. Um, I also just want to comment. We had a conversation recently with an um, expert from the conservation agriculture community, um, Andrew Oddington, and he pointed out to us that Farmers all often um, have a misconception of the role of termites. It's not ants, but termites. And um, if you study the the effect of it, you would actually understand that it doesn't always uh, termites don't always have a negative effect on on the environment, whereas they normally just killed indiscriminately. Um, mm. But on the other hand, he also pointed out that there's literally in South Africa one expert left on termites. So really, um, to all the young people, there's a, there's a gap here for um, for people to step in to, um, because these insects need advocates um, mm. for for them to survive and yeah. to explain their role in in the ecology. So Melanie, oh, please keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, well, if I can add to that, there's also only one bee taxonomist in, in South Africa, and he's retired. Um, so we need somebody that can identify bees too. <laughs> I'm hoping to go into pollination, but oh. yeah, we termites and bees and insects in general, please. <laughs> we need more interest. Anybody that's welcome that visits the garden route, please do pop in at our offices and volunteer with us you're welcome <laughs> thank you Melanie. another way to put it is that they are job opportunities so yeah please yeah. step into it yeah all right you on this uh caswell is uh applauding thank you very much for that caswell um Johan, it seems to me we've covered it tonight um i want to before you leave just thank everybody for joining us tonight Thank you again to the Unlocking Nature team that's been doing this for four years in such a brilliant way. And um, I've uh, sort of gathered a community of uh, like-minded friends and I think making a significant difference. When we look at the views of Unlocking Nature and also Share Screen Africa, 
um, it's not so much that we look at numbers. We look at how long people actually view what we've put out there. And that's significant. That means people are really listening and learning when they go into these talks. So to the team, thank you very much. And to close to advocate Melanie Damone, thank you very much for sharing your passion with us tonight. We appreciate. And we wish all of you uh, who are uh, in the nighttime a good evening. And for those who the sun is rising at the moment, a lovely day. Thank you so much. And uh, have a good Easter and a, a holiday time now. And bye-bye. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>